my fifth birthday, my parents asked me if I wanted a bicycle or a lobster, and I went with the lobster. And uh, I always had a um, sort of knack for knowing good from not. In Great Neck, Michael Ginor is known as the all-star chef behind one of Long Island's best restaurants. But Lola, foie gras, is often the star of the menu. When I first discovered foie gras, it was uh, grilled over charcoal, and I thought it was the best thing I ever ate. Welcome to the house that foie gras built. Lola's Ginor's love letter to his hometown. He could have opened a restaurant anywhere, but he chose Long Island to be the place he experiments with new ways to cook foie gras. After nearly a decade in business, Lola remains a Long Island favorite. Greeted with a distinct cherry red dining room and modern decor, customers are introduced to a menu that expertly fuses flavors from the Middle East, Mediterranean, and North Africa. We have found that the easiest way to introduce people to foie gras is to prepare in a steak-like preparation. There's good texture on the seared sides and a molten interior. People find that to be a very easy way to get introduced to foie gras. Foie gras, which means fat liver in French, uh, is the liver of a duck that's been specially fed with corn by hand feeding or a French term which means gavage. Michael and his executive chef, Lenny, invited me into the kitchen to demonstrate their favorite ways to make this rich delicacy. So, we got a pan nice and hot, right? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna quickly sear it. And now what we like to do is we like to baste the baste foie. It. So we get a nice sear on the other side. I'm mesmerized by this. Yeah. Liquid gold. It is liquid gold. So, now we actually are ready to uh, plate this for you. I'll let Len Lenny does a lot of the plating here at Lola because he's got a nice plating sensibility. So talk to me about exactly what this dish is and how it ultimately came together. So we wanted just something really light and healthy for the menu. So. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like exactly what Weight Watchers would want. Exactly. I'm sitting here drooling right now just looking at you. <laughs> oh, you're gonna like this one. The foie gras is like crisp on the top, melted through the middle, almost like very earthy dish. Very earthy, earthy lentils. The lentils is a really nice complement to it. How many people actually finish this whole dish? Oh, that's easy. That one's <laughs> not, not, that's not bad. Finishing a whole foie gras is a challenge. Lenny Messina joined the team in 2013 and has become Michael's right-hand man. When you visit Lola these days, it is Lenny who incorporates Hudson Valley foie gras into the menu. Growing up on Long Island, I was fortunate to have some opportunity where my father is a certified executive pastry chef. So while everyone else was out skateboarding, I was making rainbow cookies. That's what really sparked my love for the industry. Michael's passion is incredible. Uh, intimidating a lot of the time, but incredible. I think his passion for the business and for the farm and for here, and I think that that's what makes him uh, so incredible at what he does. When you see foie gras on a menu in the U.S., it is most likely because of Michael. Many Long Islanders know him as Lola's owner, but what you probably don't know is that to the rest of the world, he is the undisputed king of foie gras. After tasting the final product, we traveled upstate to his Catskills farm to learn more. We spent several days with him and his crew, learning how foie gras is raised and how versatile it can be in the kitchen. We're here with Michael Ginor, co-founder of Hudson Valley Foie Gras, and his right-hand man, Marcus, and we're at the beginning stages of your massive foie gras operation where they begin as babies, right? Yes, and interestingly enough, this is actually the original place where foie gras was produced in the United States. And so here in the middle of essentially desolate Sullivan County begins your... The American foie gras journey. Journey, I like that. <laughs> Wow, so it's like 
much warmer in here. Yes. Uh, you can feel that 90 degree heat coming off the floor that you guys were talking about. Right. Right. Well, this is a nursery environment, okay. so obviously we have to keep them fed and hydrated and warm, uh, much like a baby nursery. And there are approximately 5,000 one-week-old hatchlings here, and every week we get a new 5,000, and every week they move along the growth cycle. What breed of ducks are these? So this little guy is known as a mullard. A mullard is the French word for mule because it's a mule duck. Right. It's a hybrid, asexual duck. The father is a Muscovy, which is a wild duck. The mother is a domesticated Pekin. And we artificially create this particular duck as a mullard because it's very resistant to disease and produces a foie gras that's more versatile in usage. After the ducks leave the nursery, they are transferred to another building where they mature to 11 weeks old. From there, they move to the last and most controversial step of the foie gras process. This process is what the French call gavage, or force feeding. Marcus, explain to me how this process works. How are the ducks fed? Well, ducks don't have a uh, a similar physiology. The trachea and the esophagus are separate and parallel. So inserting the tube, there is no gag reflex. So the lining of the throat is different. We're just dropping the food into that sac and we feed them about three times a day, which is reflective of what would happen in nature. This is not that different from how it was done 5,000 years ago. The ducks will stay here for three weeks. From here, they make their final move to the processing plant, where their livers are carefully harvested. So how many foie gras are produced every day? Well, we do about 5,000 a week. There's some variation, but basically an average of about 1,000 a day. We take the foie gras out carefully, set it aside. It's a healthy looking foie gras right there. How much does that thing weigh, you think, roughly? Uh, about two and a quarter pounds. So this is a grade A liver right here? Yes. That is very clear. It has a good size. It's very firm, which indicates a high fat content. And so that's, a, that's an A-quality liver. We're saving all of the parts. Still save the large pieces of body fat. Right. Those are rendered down to make rendered duck fat. Hudson Valley originally started as a foie gras producer, but has expanded to provide all kinds of duck products. Jenny Chamberlain, who heads product development, showed us the various products sold through their long-standing business partner, D'Artagnan. You see here, this is the nice little river of gold. And you see D'Artagnan actually says, better than butter. It is better than butter. After learning about the foie gras process, it was impossible not to talk about the controversy that surrounds it. Michael is confident in his company and the precautions they take to ensure the ducks are taken care of. He prides himself on the company's transparency. Traditionally, foie gras farms were very close quarters, and we have, early on in our days, have made a departure that there is nothing that we are hiding. We've made a decision that it should be an open farm that anybody can visit and see for their own eyes how the foie gras is produced, how the ducks are treated. You should study both sides and make your own decision. At the end of the day, a consumer needs to be an educated consumer. The issue regarding foie gras really lives and dies by the process of this gavage. This is very much steeped in uh, a misunderstanding of a duck's anatomy, duck's migration behavior, and the fact that ducks gorge prior to migrating in order to enlarge their own livers. We take all that natural capability and turn it into uh, farming. Traveling back to the north shore of Long Island, we see that Lola is where Michael takes the finished product one step further. It's here in the kitchen where he combines Hudson Valley foie gras with the expertise of Lenny and together they create some of Long Island's best foie gras dishes. Tell me how the magic happens here. Well, this is an A-grade foie gras. It's approximately, it's, it's about two and a half pounds. It's quite large. So we're actually gonna portion it into some slices that we're gonna sear for you later on. Now, what we like to do, and this is really more for presentation purposes, is we score it 
and we only scored on one side, which is the side that the foie gras is going to be seared on. So now you're gonna try foie gras, straightforward seared, very steak-like preparation. And this dish is always on our menu. Welcome to the house that foie gras this built. I can see why this is the gateway foie gras dish. I mean, it's like, how can you not love this? So, Lenny, you remember the first time you, uh, you tasted foie gras? What was that like? I always thought it was an incredible product. I never knew I would be uh, able to work with it as intimately as I am now. So I'm grateful, but it's amazing. Do you remember the first time? First time I had foie gras. We're about foie gras still, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Lenny came to Lola as a line cook five years ago. Since then, he has gone from being the pupil to the man who keeps Michael on the cutting edge. But at 27 years old, you don't get to shepherd someone's passion project without building a strong relationship first. It's funny because the more that Michael and I started cooking together, um, the more we would see a lot of similarities and a lot of differences. He gave me a bunch of ingredients and said, this is this dish and I want you to plate it. And I took the puree and I just splattered it on the plate. And he was like, what are you doing? Like, are you out of your mind? Then when I composed the whole plate, he was like, that's really awesome. I love that. Beautiful. Wow. Through the years, the two of them have developed a father and son-like bond. Well, you know how a dog is, one year is seven? In the restaurant business, one year is like five. Bonding within the restaurant field is much more intense. For me, Lenny has really been a godsend because he's uh, smart, talented, loyal, and above anything else, honest. Michael has not only found a disciple in Lenny, but a chef who has adopted his passion for the future. Because of the confidence in their relationship, Michael is free to travel the globe and expand his business, knowing that Lenny is there to take care of Lola. I, the only direction that I see my career going is with Michael. Whether it's here at Lola, at Hudson Valley, or elsewhere, what I do know is that I'm committed for, for long term, and I want to see where this goes. After spending a few weeks in New York, checking in on the farm and the restaurant, Michael is back out on the road, refusing to stop until everyone is converted to foie gras lovers. I would tell a chef that there's a way for you to take your sensibilities and aesthetics and incorporate foie gras in a way that defines your style. There is a place for foie gras on your menu. Michael can still relive the moment when the trajectory of his life changed in an instant. Sitting in a little cafe in Israel, he had his first bite of foie gras. I first discovered and fell in love with foie gras in 1983 when I was a student in Israel. I became obsessed with it. The texture, the warmth. He's still able to taste that first bite and describe it in detail. It's the look on his face when telling the story, like talking about your first love, that makes him the king of foie gras. I've been asked why foie gras is so popular since the day I started producing foie gras, and I have never found a perfect answer. Maybe the singular greatest food product that the world's ever known.